السلام عليكم ورحمة الله بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين آمين اللهم لك الحمد كما ينبغي لجلال وجهك ولعظيم سلطانك لا نحصي ثناء عليك أنت كما أثنيت على نفسك اللهم لك الحمد حتى ترضى ولك الحمد إذا رضيت ولك الحمد من بعد الرضا uh, الحمد لله Welcome to everyone uh, to our first Ramadan Tafsir session الحمد لله This has been something that we have been doing the past few years and it's actually something that has extended beyond Ramadan and so subhanallah we started it one year in Ramadan and uh, the goal in that year was to go through the entire like translation of the Quran and finish it within the month of Ramadan. That was the plan. When we started though, we realized that there was benefit, no doubt, in going through the translation quickly and being able to complete from cover to cover a reading of the Quran. But what we found was that there was a different type of sweetness to kind of slowing it down, to focusing on a little bit more of an in-depth look at the verses, at the way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is addressing us. And so we definitely didn't finish the Quran uh, or the translation cover to cover. And we said, you know what, we'll continue throughout the year. And so what started as one Ramadan and one uh, set of classes in Ramadan became a full-time class that subhanAllah we have uh, many of the sisters who started with us in that Ramadan have consistently uh, joined and, and, and been an active part of that class taking notes and, and, and engaging and all of these things. And it continued through the following Ramadans as well. And so what we did was that we have a specific Ramadan schedule in which that, uh, you know, we have a lot more classes, a lot more engagement with the Qur'an because it is the month of the Qur'an, no doubt. And then we continued throughout the year at a little bit of a slower pace in terms of frequency and amount of times that, that, we, have met, that we met. So alhamdulillah, this is... If I'm not mistaken, I think the fourth year that we are doing that or that we're engaging in this Ramadan tafsir, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, again with many of the same people who started with us in the beginning and with many new people who have joined along the way, who have contributed along the way. This is as much of a two-way benefit as it is anything else, Alhamdulillah. And so it is a, uh, a blessing and an honor to be able to use a little bit of this time in Ramadan to engage with the word of Allah. And so we started that uh, Ramadan from the beginning of the Quran, from Surah Al-Fatiha. And now, alhamdulillah, we are in uh, the, you could say, the second half of the Quran, closer to the last third of the Quran, Surah Al-Sajda which is what, inshallah, we will beginning, be beginning today, bi'idhnillah. So I know that there's a lot of people who are continuing from our class, and they're probably like, yeah, we already know all this, right? And then there are a lot of people who join because their Ramadan schedules open up a little bit more, because they're able to give a little bit more time. And now with the unique circumstances as well, alhamdulillah, we're hoping for an even uh, larger kind of engagement and attendance from our brothers, from our sisters in the community and, and beyond. And jazakumullah khair to uh, the people who are working behind the scenes, literally. I mean, we're using this application here where we have literally people behind the scenes. And the amount of work that goes into being able to stream this. Like, I'm not actually at 75th. I think you guys know that, right? It's a, it's a green screen. I was going to put a picture of, you know, like something like a beach or something, <laughs> we thought for Ramadan we'll keep it as it is. But uh, the amount of work that goes into kind of seamlessly executing something like this, I know we're live now on 
uh, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, um, and I think something else, YouTube even as well, right? And all I had to do was just press a button, and I'm here, alhamdulillah. So jazakumullah khair to all those who are working behind the scenes. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless them and their families in this month that they're facilitating for us to be able to do something like this, alhamdulillah. Um, also, uh, something that I wanted to, to mention was the methodology of how, inshallah, we're going to be uh, proceeding. So this is, like we said, not a kind of run through of the translation, nor is it a super in-depth tafsir, right? But rather we kind of try to take a middle course. We take a middle course in which we try to unpack some of the meanings and try to, in, in which we try to look at the surahs and the verses that we're taking from a bird's eye view to try to understand, you know, what's the goal of this surah? For example, what is the benefit of these ayats being placed in this way and as opposed to that way. And these are all things that, you know, uh, that we try to do based off of, you know, what we've come across, what we've learned and these kind of things as well. And, but it's in no uh, means or no way a end all be all for, for the Quran. The Quran is much, much, much more uh, in depth and much, much more deep than what we can give it justice to. Even if we had spent an entire lifetime of delving into the Quran and its meanings and its secrets and its beauties, we would only be scratching the surface. And that is the beauty of this revelation. That is the beauty of this book that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us. That it has such a multi-layered beauty and such a multi-level approach in terms of its meanings, in terms of the benefits that we take from it. And it's something that is relevant and beneficial across all times and across all places. And that's another amazing thing, that you read the Qur'an and you try to unlock within it, you know, just the meaning and the translation. And then reflecting over it, you realize that it's as relevant today for us as it was for the companions who was revealed in their presence 1400 years ago. And you'll go through the Quran and if you reflect over it and you reflect over your own condition and you reflect on what we see in the world around us, it's as if the Quran was revealed at this time. Meaning it's as if you woke up and the Quran literally is talking about what's happening today and what's happening now and what's happening in my life and what's happening in your life. This though is only unlocked when we're able to, to, to explore the Qur'an's meanings. And this is the benefit of this book. And this is the ultimate purpose of this book. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent it down for us in order for us, in order for us to, to reflect over it, to contemplate over it, to take it as our personal guide and as our personal blueprints for our lives and for understanding the world around us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Kitabun anzalnahu ilayka mubarakun liyaddabbaru ayatih. That this is a book that we sent down and it's blessed. It's mubarak. It's a source of blessing for those who engage with it. And then Allah says why he sent it down, one of its primary purposes, liyaddabbaru ayatih. So that we can reflect, so that we can, you know, uh, contemplate over its meanings, over its beauties, and then we can see how is this Qur'an speaking to me. And you know, as part of our class uh, that, we, uh, that we do on a weekly basis, you know, I'm talking about before Ramadan, we go through sometimes these keys to unlock some of the benefits of the Qur'an, and we'll mention them inshallah as we come across maybe some examples of them here in the Qur'an. But the first, the primary one that we spoke about last week before Ramadan, is that when we go to the Qur'an, that we take it as if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is speaking directly to, to me and to you. That we don't go to the Qur'an just as like, okay, let me just, you know, just fly through it because, and this is something that we're all, we all do at one time or another, right? 
myself definitely included. But sometimes to be able to go to the Quran and just see it as this message from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to me. See it as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala directly speaking to my condition. What does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala want me to take, want me to benefit from what I am reading? And that is the first way for us to be able to appreciate and to unlock the beauties of, of this book. And then in Ramadan, in the month, in this blessed, beautiful month that we're in as well. Even more so, this idea, right? So the Quran is not limited to Ramadan, definitely not, right? But it was revealed in this month. And this month is special primarily because of the revelation of the Quran, right? When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the month of Ramadan, usually the first thing we think about when we talk about Ramadan is fasting, right? We think about the fasting, the iftar, the tarawih. Right? But when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions this month in the Quran, He says, Shahru Ramadan alladhi unzila fihi al-Quran. One of the keys also for contemplation is we see what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mention first and why? So when Allah mentions the Quran or mentions the month of Ramadan first, the first thing that he tells us about is that it was the month in which the Quran was revealed. Giving us a very clear hint, a very clear direction that this month is a month to renew our relationship with the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is a month to reconnect to Allah through the most beloved thing to him, and that is his word. And that's why our scholars, they mention that there's no way to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala more so than what came from him directly. And that is his words, Azza wa Jal. And that's why even, you know, subhanAllah, what is the, the, the tarawih allowing us to do that we value so much? The tarawih is giving us an opportunity to recite, to hear the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? This is why in this month specifically, the Qur'an is so much more emphasized. And it's emphasized in a way that allows us to renew that relationship with it in order for us to make this the thing that we're going to take with us out of this month as well. That we renew our relationship so that after the month of Ramadan, that we keep that Qur'an with us and we don't just leave it in Ramadan. And how do we do that? We do that by creating a habit with the Qur'an. And inshallah, this class, the goal of it together is that we reconnect to the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by going through its meanings, by trying to unlock some of its beauties. And this is something that we can only do if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us the ability gives us the tawfiq to do so. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us that, to allow us in our very, very small effort of studying this book together, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blesses that. And with that, we will be inshallah, hopefully by the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, fulfilling one of the goals of this month, that relationship with the Quran. And this is why you find the scholars and the companions and those who came and those, you know, who, they, the ones who recognized the goal, the benefit of this in this month, they would uh, put away a lot of the other things and they would focus on the Qur'an. Imam Malik, rahimahullah, one of the great, great scholars of, uh, of Islamic law, one of the great fuqaha, uh, the, the madhab of Imam Malik, one of the most knowledgeable people in our ummah that he would say that when the month of Ramadan would come, he would put away the books of fiqh and he would just focus on the Qur'an. And this doesn't mean that we can't benefit from other things. No, we're in a time and we're in a place where we need to benefit from as much as we can in all aspects of the Islamic sciences and in learning. But just to show the emphasis that they would have on the Qur'an in these times, that they would put away even the other things that were beneficial to focus on the most beneficial thing. Someone like Imam al-Shafi'i who would read and you would hear this and you're like, come on, that doesn't even sound realistic. That sounds like it's way too much. Would read the Quran 60 times, six zero in the month of Ramadan. And again, that doesn't mean that that should be our goal. I'm just going to fly through the Quran and read it. But these were a people, again, who had a deep, deep relationship with the Quran, right? And so for them, 
they had different goals, they had different aspirations, they had different ways to connect with the Qur'an. But the idea, the benefit that we take from hearing something like that and understanding something like that is how much effort they would put into that relationship with the Qur'an. Other scholars, they would say things like when Ramadan would come, we would focus on two things. Two things. The Qur'an and feeding people. Qira'atul Qur'an wa ta'amu ta'am. Like the two goals of Ramadan, we would focus on our relationship with the Qur'an and just feeding people. Just be people who would, who would feed those in need, feed those who are, who are fasting, right? So those are, these are things that we can make our goals in Ramadan to be able to reconnect with this book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to be able to reconnect with those who are in need around us as well and provide whatever support, whatever benefit that we can. So this is uh, one of the greatest uses of, of, of your time, of our time in Ramadan. It's connecting to the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and it is the prophetic way and it is the angelic way as well. It's the prophetic way and it's the angelic way. What do we mean by that? Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu ma he would say that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam was the most generous of people. And he was the most generous in the month of Ramadan, generous with his goodness, right? With his wealth, with his time, with his, you know, his, his knowledge, with his good spirits. That he was the most generous of people with goodness. And then he would say, and he was even more generous in Ramadan. And then he would connect it with, he said, Hina yalqahu Jibril And he's so he says, when did this happen? He said that when him and Jibreel would gather together in the month of Ramadan and they would do mudarasa of the Qur'an. They would recite the Qur'an to each other. How beautiful of a gathering is something like that. You have the, the Prophet wasallam, the greatest of humanity, and you have Jibreel, the greatest of angels, and they would gather together every night in Ramadan. The, the hadith continues, it says, fi kulli layla. In every night of Ramadan, and they would do mudarasa of the Qur'an. They would do that back and forth. So us, so our mudarasa, your recitation of the Qur'an by yourself, with your family, you listening to the Qur'an in the morning broadcasts that we have and following along. This is the prophetic methodology of spending uh, time in Ramadan, of giving that focus and that effort to uh, the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Ramadan. So again, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he blesses our time, that he blesses our uh, all of our efforts in, in putting in a flawed and a, uh, you know, an attempt that has shortcomings, no doubt, but hopefully an attempt that will reconnect us with the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay, so... Uh, we are going to begin, inshallah, like we said, where we had stopped uh, in our previous classes, and that is in Surat as sajda Surat as sajda So if uh, you have a, usually what, what we recommend, and, and again, I don't know how many uh, people beyond the ones who are normally in our class are here, um, but they know kind of... Uh, the way that the way that we go through this. So what we usually do, and maybe we'll have this for uh, from from tomorrow. It's something that kind of slipped my mind because we're using a different platform. But what we usually do is we have one of our brothers recite uh, the uh, the verses that we're going to be covering, and then what we'll be covering after that as well. And then we go through. The translation so we have then one of our sisters recite or, or read the translation and then uh, we go through the verses verse by verse so some of the verses we may go a little bit more in depth some we may go through a little bit quicker so what I would recommend for those who are kind of maybe attending for the first time or even those who have attended before but haven't been able to do this is that you have the translation or uh, the, the Qur'an, the, the Arabic and the translation together, or just the translation, that's fine. And that you also have something, you know, that you can maybe write some notes with, right? It's good, of course, to just uh, listen and just to be a part of the, the experience. 
inshallah, but the, uh, a, a higher level, a more in-depth level of benefit comes when we are able to kind of write down. And this was one of the first advices that, you know, we got uh, when, you know, when we were engaging with some of our teachers is that we make sure that we have always with us something to write with and something to write on. And now in the digital age, sometimes that's just having your phone out and being, you know, having your notes open and, and, and writing those notes or dictating those notes, right? But there is definitely uh, a benefit, you know, to having a laptop in front of you as well and being able to write notes in your notes. And then uh, if you can, and this is something that, you know, is maybe becoming a lost thing, but I know a lot of uh, the sisters in our class, they would do this as well. Some very, very intensely, they would write notes by hand, right? And, and there is something definitely uh, in a, with an additional level of benefit to be able to write something with your hand and and to see it and and to kind of take that in through that through that way when you write there is like a level of you know you being able to capture what you're hearing what you're listening to and then go, being able to go back to it and 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 benefit from it so that's something that I would I would recommend as well and even if you have a translation of the Quran that has like, uh, you know, that has the, you know, spaces in the margins. There's nothing wrong with you writing your notes there as well. Okay. Uh, even if it has the Arabic and the English and you want to write in the margins or you have a specific translation that you want to write in, there's nothing wrong with that. This is something that can be beneficial for you. Obviously with, you know, you do it with, with respect that goes without saying. But writing in those margins, that is something that is uh, okay to do and actually can be beneficial. Because then if you go back and you're reading the translation or you have the Arabic and the translation side by side, you're able, when you go back to it, to see kind of, okay, when we spoke about this ayah, we talked about this. And I'm not sure what this word meant, but we clarified it here, right? And so it becomes something that, you know, you're able to like, okay, review well. And you're able that maybe 10 years from now, you go back to the same mushaf, the same translation at least, and you see your notes, things that you had forgotten. And this it's a very beautiful feeling to go back to something that you didn't even remember was there. And then to say, oh, I remember that. Not just for the, the information, but then the memories that, that come with that as well, right? So that's something that I would strongly uh, recommend as well. And the specific translations that I would recommend, since a lot of people are on uh, digitally following a translation, they may not have the translation in front of them, but I, I would recommend everyone, if you don't have it, then you have a translation of the Qur'an with you. In a language that you're comfortable with, of course, right? Or a tafsir of the Qur'an. If you're, if you're Arabic speaking, Arabic understanding, that you have a tafsir uh, that you can kind of follow and go through a physical copy. So if you don't have one, order one. Uh, the translations that I would recommend are the, I think it's the Oxford uh, Press one. It's by M.A. Uh, M.A.S. Abdul Halim. That's, it's like a blue cover. That's one that is, is, is highly recommended. I would also recommend the, uh, there is uh, another translation that's been done recently that's uh called the, the clear quran i think for khan foundation they use it that's what they distribute in their da'wah efforts right but it's it's uh it's called the clear quran it also from what i've come across is a is a good kind of fluid uh easy to read translation and then the translation that we've been using this is kind of the one that we just have gotten accustomed to uh it is the translation that is called the Qur'an Made Easy. The Qur'an Made Easy, complete English translation with inline commentary. With inline commentary. Now, uh, translations, it's called the Qur'an Made Easy. Uh, complete English translation with inline commentary. Now, obviously, no translation is perfect, right? That's the benefit of going directly to the Arabic text, 
right? But these translations give us a good kind of reading and understanding in a way that's easily digestible. And if there's issues in the specific translation, like so I'm using what I have in front of me, just out of just, you know, this is the one that we've been using. And I just stuck with it is the, the, the one that I mentioned last, the Quran made easy. And if there's issues within some of the translation, that, those are things that, uh, that we'll point out, inshallah, and that we will uh, mention. But uh, of course, the primary benefit is in the Arabic language. And that's not something, you know, to put us down. Oh, I don't speak Arabic. I can't benefit from the Quran. No. Right? The message of the Quran is so powerful that it transcends, you know, that it can be uh, felt in whatever language that it's translated to. But when it was revealed in the Arabic language, it was revealed in the Arabic language for a specific purpose as well. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He tells us that it was revealed in this, uh, in this lucid, clear Arabic language in order to understand. Not just so that the first generation who, reach, who the Quran reaches to, so they understand it because they're Arabic speaking, but because of the power in the Arabic language and the way that it's employed and used by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that makes it so uh, powerful in delivering a clear and unambiguous and an unrivaled, unmatched meaning, right? So the goal of all of us should be to be able to engage in the Quran in its original language. And that's part of the benefit of what we do here is that we mention some of the subtleties, some of the benefits, not all, that's not something that I would ever claim to know or to have. This is, again, like I said, more of a, uh, a group study, right, than an actual me teaching tafsir, uh, because, you know, I am someone obviously who's, who, uh, you know, is, is a student and, and, and learn from our teachers and, and, and things that like that. So, it's more of a, of a group study, but the idea is that we try to make the Arabic language, for those who are not familiar with it, to make it a little bit more familiar to us. So when we're reciting in salah, so when we're listening to the Qur'an in whatever time, whether it's in tarawih or even after Ramadan, so that we're able to engage with it and connect with it. You know, I've mentioned this to our class before, that... Um, you know, some of some of the people that I know that that were leading Salat al-Taraweeh, they memorized the Qur'an at a young age, beautiful voices, mashallah, uh, very strong memorization, that they would lead Taraweeh, okay? And, and they said that, you know, so we would lead it, and it was great, alhamdulillah. But they said that th their lives really changed, or their experience changed, especially for, for Tarawih, when they had started, you know, to travel and go and study and, and, and learn what they were actually reciting. So they said like things like, for example, like that year that I actually started to understand what I was reading, that was the greatest Ramadan experience that I had. Because now when I'm reciting, and it's the same beautiful voice, it's the same Tarawih, right? But now that I understand what it is that I'm reciting, what it is that I'm listening to, it changed the experience. It changed my relationship with, with the Qur'an. And that's the goal, that we read the Qur'an, that we listen to the Qur'an, and you say, you know what, I know what that word means. I know the general meaning of what's being conveyed here. And alhamdulillah, it, it has a much, much more uh, emphasis and a much stronger, like it hits a lot harder, right? It just hits different, as they say. So um, that's the the goal, the benefit of of being able to kind of take ownership of our relationship with the Quran, and then inshallah we get to a point that you know we're able to to go to the tafsir, we're able to go to the writings of those who wrote in the Quran and see uh, the gems and the beauties and the wisdoms. You know, subhanAllah, uh, the books of tafsir that go into the meanings of the Quran and the reflections and the benefits. Yes, 
there are many that are in English now, but if you look at the books of tafsir that are in their original uh, languages that they were written in, you find, subhanAllah, that you have some people, for example, uh, there is a, a sheikh who, who passed away recently in Mecca, Sheikh Al-Harari. Uh, may Allah have mercy on him. I remember I was in uh, Medina in the house of one of my, one of my friends, one of my uh, teachers. And I see a, a, a book in, uh, in his bookshelf, right? And it, it's like 30 volumes. I'm like, dude, what is that? <laughs> I was at the Encyclopedia of Islam right there. And he's like, no, this is uh, Sheikh Al-Harari, who was a living scholar at that time. May Allah have mercy on him. Uh, he said, uh, this is his tafsir. Right? It was like 35, 36 volumes. And, and it's like, you know, subhanAllah, that the Quran really is an ocean that has no shore. That it's something that um, if... You know, uh, the more that you give it, right, the more that you're able to uncover from it. And that's why no single person can claim to have like what's called ilmam of the Qur'an, claim to have like this encompassing knowledge of it. Rather, in every time and in every place, there are new benefits that are extracted. There are new wisdoms that are taken. There are new meanings that are explored. And for every single individual person, you know, when you learn the meaning and when you reflect over it, that Qur'an kind of mixes with your own uh, experience, with your own uh, just reality, and, and there's new benefits and new reflections and new wisdoms. How many times have we heard someone talking about the Qur'an and said, and, and you know, and, and are, they're able to, you know, mention something that, you know, like, wow, subhanAllah, I never thought of it like that. Right? I never connected it in that way. Right? That's the beauty of the Qur'an. But it's something that requires our, our time and our focus and our effort. And I mention this a lot. And I'll mention this. I know people who are in the class, uh, they've, heard, they've heard me say this a lot. But for the benefit, as a reminder for them, for myself, and as a reminder for, uh, for those who are joining now, kind of us for the first time, you know, one of uh, the, the great mufassirs of our time, his name is Sheikh Abdullah Amin al -Shantiti. He has a lot of his tafsir, by the way, online, uh, like re video recordings. So he teaches in uh, the Masjid al-Nabawi, in, in the Prophet's Masjid. And, you know, he would say something that would, you know, he would, he would repeat it a lot. And I was actually just listening just to something small of his recently, and he mentioned it. He mentioned it again. And uh, it was something that at the time when I kind of first would hear it from him, I'm like, okay, it's very... I get it. It's very simple, very straightforward. Like, why is he emphasizing it so much? But subhanAllah, it's something of that, that, that really just stuck. Uh, not that I'm applying it, but it, it stuck in terms of just hearing. Uh, and it's, it's so, so simple, but so powerful. He would say like, you know, uh, this Quran, it has uh, the, the solutions to all of our problems. It has the guidance in all of our situations. It, it, it will give you its secrets. It will give you its benefits. It will give you its goodness. You just have to give it one thing because you have to give it time. You have to give it time. You have to give it time. And he would emphasize that, right? He says you have to give it waqt. You have to give it waqt. Like, like quality time uh, with the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is something that is a uh, directive for each and every single one of us, by the way, Okay. There's no like hierarchy here where it's like for me to be able to uh, read the Quran or think about the Quran or reflect over the Quran, I have to have studied in this institution for this many years in this way. Okay, no, it doesn't work like that. Right? The Quran is meant as a guidance for each and every single one of us. <clears throat> yes, there is a process <clears throat> and there is a uh, methodology Meaning I can't just go to the Qur'an and just open up like some people uh, may do and just say, oh, I think this means this just because this is what I think. No, right? There's a reflective aspect of it that is guided by what we're doing now. And, and things not limited to what we're doing now, but things like what we're doing now, which is studying the meaning, studying the understandings of, uh, you know, the companions of those who came, of those who are closer to the revelation of the Qur'an. So we know 
what the meanings of the Qur'an are, but then the reflection of that, the internalization, the contemplation, the application of those things, that's something that when I have these tools, I can go to the Qur'an and I can reflect over it. It doesn't mean that I'm going to go and write my own tafsir, okay? I'm not saying you can't, but that's something that requires a long journey as well, okay? Or you write your own tafsir, no one's going to buy it, I promise, right? But um, that's something that can be a goal. Why not? Why not? And I know, uh, subhanAllah, we have some people who have put in so much effort into their study of the Qur'an that they could write their own reflections over the Qur'an. No doubt about it, right? But I'm not saying that that's the goal. Right? But the goal is that we become familiar enough with the meanings, with the goals, with like the maqasid, the, the overarching uh, kind of messages of the Qur'an, and then its specific rulings and these things, that then we have that familiarity that we're able to, to, to access uh, this book and we're able to reflect on it, apply it, see connections between it, right? Uh, between its verses, see connections with the sunnah, see connections with our, our collective reality. And, and, and then take it what it's supposed to be. What it's supposed to be is that, like we said, our individual guide and our individual uh, roadmap for our lives. This is something that is for everyone. For everyone. Kitabun anzalnahu ilayka liyadabbaru ayate. It's very powerful. Allah is telling the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we sent down this book to you. He's telling the messenger that this book was revealed to you. Right? But he then doesn't, he doesn't say after that, لِتَتَدَبَّرَ ayati. He doesn't say, so then that you can reflect over its verses. He says, we sent it down to you so that they can reflect over its verses. All of them. Us. That we can reflect over its verses. So it's revealed to the Prophet ﷺ. It's speaking to his reality. It's speaking to the time of the companion. But it's applicable, it's relevant, it's meant to be digested, to, re to be reflected, to be contemplated over by, by us as well. By us as well. And so I know this has been a very long introduction. Many of you are probably, especially the sisters who, who are consistent in our class before, are like, we get it, start with Surah Al-Sajdah. But I think it's important as a reminder for all of us and as a specific kind of message for our brothers and sisters who are joining now, for uh, the first time that, uh, that they can, inshallah, benefit uh, from uh, what we're trying to do here, what we're trying to do. So uh, another thing, uh, what I would say is if there are any questions uh, through the different social media platforms that you can ask your questions, inshallah, and uh, we can address them as well as we go throughout the tafsir, as we go through these verses and these ayats, inshallah. And, um, you know, so that it, it can become something that's, a, again, a two-way benefit engaging. Uh, usually when we had class in person, we would always have like, you know, uh, involvement, interjections, sometimes too much, <laughs> I'm just joking, uh, from those who attended the class in person. Then when we moved to WebEx, there's also that forum for people to be able to ask questions, to be able to engage. And now, alhamdulillah, on this forum here, that when we have kind of all of our social media platforms linked, uh, I have access here. I see all of uh, the comments, wa alaikum salam to all of you, uh, <clears throat> that you can ask your questions, you can you know, give your reflections, your comments as well. And we can incorporate that in, in, in our study of, of the Qur'an as well. So I'll give a few minutes here because usually what I do is, uh, what we do is people get a little bit tired. And I know it's uh, the first few days of, of Ramadan. And this is going to be a little bit uh, maybe more intense, right? Uh, because it's going to be, you know, four days a, a week. Uh, for the next four weeks. And usually our class time, our class schedule is one day a week. And so we're taking that same time and we're quadrupling it, right? Everything is going to be times four. So there's going to be a little bit 
more intensity. There's going to be a little bit, uh, you know, more time put here. But inshallah, uh, hopefully it will be something beneficial for, for all of us. So yes, if you have questions, you can just write uh, the questions there on whatever platform. So I'm seeing uh, the comments from Facebook, from uh, Instagram, right? I don't see anything yet from, uh, sorry, from Facebook and from YouTube. I don't see anything uh, uh, else uh, or any other uh, or a any other of the social media platforms, but I think all of them would come up here. Alhamdulillah, this is a really, really uh, nice uh, setup that we have here. Uh, so it's something that whatever forum you're, you're engaging with us on, you can ask those questions, inshallah. You can give your comments, answer the questions that I will have, and you will be able, inshallah, to uh, to have you know that, that access with us. So alhamdulillah, even though we are uh, separate, we have the opportunity to be connected in this way. And, you know, subhanAllah, I was thinking about this, and I'm sure this is something that you all have re realized or recognized as well, that usually this class is something that's done in person, right? We do it at, uh, at the masjid, at ICN, at Ogden or 75th. And, uh, and then we have, like, I record by voice, and I upload to a, a WhatsApp group that we have as a limited amount of people. But now, subhanAllah, that this situation, it gives us the opportunity to have, to be broadcasting live, which we don't, which we didn't really uh, do before, right? But broadcasting live so that our it reaches our entire community. Alhamdulillah. Jazakumullah khair again to those who are working to make this a reality, to the masjid, to the, to, to the admin, to those behind the scenes. Uh, and it allows us as well to reach beyond that, right? Anyone with YouTube or Facebook or any of these things, they can access this, alhamdulillah. And uh, yes, okay, good. So they answered and, and that they will also be recorded. They're also being recorded so that they can be benefited from later. So alhamdulillah, it gives us an opportunity to engage and to benefit from a wider audience and a wider uh, spectrum and group of our community and even beyond alhamdulillah so there is no doubt benefit and blessing in our current situation in our current circumstances we would have loved to be in the company of all of you in the house of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala right but alhamdulillah uh from the comfort of your home you know usually we have when we did like on the webex i had to mute everyone because we hear like dishes being done in the background and conversations being had. And alhamdulillah, people eating, maybe not so much as now uh, now because of Ramadan. But you have, inshallah, from the comfort of your home. I would say to make it, uh, you know, something that you engage your family in, right? This is going to be a tafsir, inshallah, an engagement with the Quran that is open and that is, uh, you know, uh, relevant, inshallah, to all age groups. Maybe like we'll say like three and above. I'm just joking. But uh, inshallah, we'll, we'll make it uh, something that that everyone inshallah can benefit from. So it's something that can be done as a family if you want to watch the recording later on as a family and, and, and then give your feedback, your comments, your reflections. That's something that we've always benefited from. So as much as we would have loved to be together in the masjid, alhamdulillah, we're not uh, in the masjid by, by choice, right? Meaning it's not something that we're choosing to do or saying we're leaving the masjid. No, we're uh, not in the masjid, alhamdulillah. Like, and I say alhamdulillah, not saying we don't want to be in the masjid, but because this is the thing that is uh, what we believe is, is the right thing to be doing and the beneficial thing to be doing and the thing that is going to help not just ourselves, but our, our community, our elders and all those who uh, we want to make sure are safe and protected. And you get, inshallah, to, to watch from the comfort of your home. Like last time I said that, people would send me like <laughs> a picture of them lying on the couch with, the, with my face on the TV screen. You don't have to go to that level, right? But um, alhamdulillah, there are definitely uh, blessings in that as well. And then you get to see this green screen behind me. 
for sure. And I say it's a green screen, <laughs> but it's you get to see this. Uh, you know, what looks like we're in the masjid, alhamdulillah. And again, it's 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 a really uh, it's a really nice thing. I, yeah, I realized bef- uh, in this time how technologically unsavvy I, I am. So uh, alhamdulillah that we have people who are are taking care of that for us. I got a green screen to my house, alhamdulillah, uh, that allows us to do this. I'm like, how does this work? What do I do with this thing? But alhamdulillah, it's been made uh, facilitated and, and simple for us so that we can just focus on on this. So if there's any uh, questions now, I usually don't like to go for more than 45 minutes. People who are in my class are like, what are you talking about? You always go for more than 45 minutes. I said, I don't like to go for more than 45 minutes without giving like uh, a few minutes for uh, a break for people to ask uh, some any questions on what we talked about in the introduction and uh, and then we we would we get back into it so inshallah we'll just take a, a few minutes here if anyone has anything they want to uh, to share and then we will jump into surah sajda the chair gives it away why there's no there's chairs in the masjid there's chairs in the masjid maybe Maybe this specific chair gives it away. And then if I move the screen, you'll see like the green screen kind of go in another direction. Uh, You see things behind, right? So just as a reminder as well, it is, this will be on this same platform, right? So all of the different social media platforms that we have, alhamdulillah, Monday through Thursday, 11 at 11.30. At 11.30. And this gives also, like it's for me as well, but it gives us also, um, <laughs> it gives us also this, uh, a, a kind of a way to kind of structure our day so um, we don't just, you know, just sleep through uh, this time, right? I know this is a time where people are, are tired. People are, you know, maybe they've stayed up all night and they went to sleep after Fajr and they're like, all right, bet, I'm going to wake up 15 minutes before Asr and pray Dhuhr and then that's the beginning of my day. No, um, it is, uh, it's a good way to kind of like, okay, I need to wake up, I'll be up in the morning, alhamdulillah, and I'll have this. doesn't mean you can't rest after, of course, you know, no one's saying that. Make sure to still get your rest, make sure to still keep yourself, you know, healthy and productive, inshallah. But it's a good way, I think, to structure because after we finish, it'll be time for Salatul Dhuhr, and then inshallah you can go on with the rest of your day. Um, so, uh, what was I going to say? Yeah, I'm seeing some of these comments. Uh, <laughs> so, for a moment, I really thought you were in the message. My dad thought it was real, and he was really shocked. <laughs> <Let me wrong. laughs> yeah, maybe I shouldn't have said that I'm not in the message. That's how. how how great this green screen is, mashallah, in this in this technology. It actually looks like I'm here at, at 75th, but I'm not. I am in, in I'm in my house. Alhamdulillah. Uh, so uh, we have a question that does taking the inhaler break the fast? Okay, so this is a good question. Um, so this issue, we, 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 we did speak about it in a little bit in depth in our uh, some of our classes. There is a difference of opinion on this issue um, because of the fact that when you take the inhaler, that there's something that may go down into like basically, you know, down the throat and possibly enter into like the realm of like the stomach area, like almost like you're, you're drinking something in a way. Um, however... There's uh, some of the the uh, the contemporary fatwa councils, uh, like some of the senior scholars. So, for example, the permanent council and uh, the permanent fatwa council in in Saudi Arabia, they they said that taking the inhaler does not break the fast because it's going down into uh, the the lungs and whatever doesn't go into the lungs and may go beyond that. Uh, or may go, sorry, into the stomach, that's negligible, right? And so they, they said that it is something that is allowed. However, one of my teachers, uh, Sheikh Muhammad Muhtar al is of the opinion that it does 
break the fast. I don't know if that's an, an opinion of his that has changed. So what I would say is if that person needs it, if they if they if they're able to hold off until after iftar, like between the times of you know while, when they're fasting, they're able to hold off. That may be better to avoid that difference of opinion. But if they really need it, um, then then uh, they can take these uh, fatawa that mention that it's allowed, and there inshallah is no problem with that. And so they can use it as needed. Uh, but also keeping in mind that if a person is, you know, um, that uh, this is what uh, Sheikh Muhammad Mukhtar al-Shanqiti mentioned as well, which is that if a person really needs it, even though his opinion is that it, it breaks the fast, he said, then this person is excused in that they can take it and it would break the fast, but they're, they're considered as like under the category of someone who's ill. And so um, it wouldn't be like sinful. They would just be able to make up that day after. So that's the other side of it. However, I would say I don't have an issue with a person taking it and, and continuing with their fast based off of these uh, the other uh, fatawa that are there that are there and that's inshallah something that there's some flexibility with and inshallah it, it's, it shouldn't be an issue okay so inshallah we will uh, jump into surah al-sajda Okay, so I think I think from uh, maybe from tomorrow we will bring in someone because we can we have the ability to do that as well to bring in someone to recite and to do the translation. But uh, since we don't have that uh, today, because I, I forgot that uh, we would need to bring them in like that. Inshallah. Uh, I will recite the verses that we will be trying to cover today, and then we'll read the translation as well. Like I said, try to have the uh, something in front of you to be able to to follow. I can also screen share it, but I prefer that you have it in front of you so that you can, uh, you know, if you're writing in it, you can benefit from it. If you're seeing it, you can you can see it. Inshallah. I always feel like there is, so I'll, I'll take this question before because we still have some time. I always feel like there is some amount of water left in my mouth every time I do will do or wash my mouth. Is that a concern? So what I would say is, you know, after you uh, rinse your mouth in will do uh, and you complete your, your will do, that you, you spit out uh, if you feel like you have uh, remaining water in your mouth, that you can spit that out into the sink, Right. Uh, one or two times, but beyond that, that's you don't have to. Uh, it doesn't have to become like compulsive, where where you feel like I just have to keep spitting or I have to keep, uh, you know, I, I feel like there's water. That's that's you know, uh, after you spit out, that's the saliva that's in your mouth, and then the, if there's like a little little bit of water that can become negligible, inshallah. So uh, spit it out, clear out, clear out your mouth. That's fine after you make wudu. But don't let it become something that is compulsive and that you have to keep just spitting, uh, because then that that starts to go into the realm of uh, of like waswasa, like of just uh, something that becomes like obsessive and and, and compulsive, right? So uh, don't don't put too much thought or or uh, concern into that once you you've uh, you know spit it out or rinse after you've rinsed your mouth and shot. So. That's what I would say for that. Okay. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ألف لام م تنزيل الكتاب لا غيب فيه من رب العالمين أم يقولون افتراه بل هو الحق من ربك لتنذر قوما ما أتاهم من نذير من قبلك لعلهم يهتدون 
الله الذي خلق السماوات والأرض وما بينهما في ستة أيام ثم استوى على العرش ما لكم من دونه من ولي ولا شفيع أفلا تتذكرون يدبر الأمر من السماء إلى الأرض ثم يعرج إليه في يوم ثم يعرج إليه في يوم كان مقداره ألف سنة مما تعدون ذلك عالم الغيب والشهادة العزيز الرحيم الذي أحسن كل شيء خلقه وبدأ خلق الإنسان من طين. Those are the first seven verses. Uh, the translation of which is Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim Alif Lam Mim. There is no doubt in this revealed book from the Rub of the Universe, from the Lord of the Universe. Or do they say that He has fabricated it? No, it is the truth from your Lord. So that you may warn a nation to whom uh, a warner has not come before you, so that they may be rightly guided. It is Allah who created the heavens, the earth, and whatever is between them in six days, and then turned his attention to the throne. Besides him, and then rose over the throne, is the correct translation. Besides him, you have no protecting friend, nor any intercessor. Will you not take heed? He directs every affair from the heavens to the earth, after which every affair will ascend to him. For on a day, or on a day, the duration of which is a thousand years, according to your counts. It is he who has the knowledge of the unseen and the seen. He is mighty, the most merciful. He has beautified the creation of everything and originated the creation of man from sand. So those are uh, the first seven verses. Okay. So Surah Al-Sajda, before we go into uh, the, the verses, we will introduce this Surah. So this is a Surah that if you look in the Mus'haf, you may find different names for it. You may find different names for it. And actually this is one of the Surahs that has been referred to by many names, by many names, okay? Um, that it's called Surat As-Sajda, that's the most frequent or most common name. It's also known as Surah Alif Lam Mim As-Sajda. Also, it's referred to as Surah Tanzil As-Sajda or Surah Alif Lam Mim Tanzil As-Sajda. Uh, also, later on, it was referred to as Al-Munjiya, uh, or al Surah al Madaja. Okay, and we'll talk a little bit about this. Why so many names? So the 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 first thing that we have to understand is that the names of the surahs are there to be able to identify and to differentiate between the surahs. What's called tamiz, so that we know. Okay, this is this part of the Quran, and this is that part of the Quran. The names of the surahs, many of them have been given to us by the Prophet ﷺ. And of course, if the Prophet ﷺ named a surah, then that is the primary name and, and sometimes the only name that that surah is given. Okay? So for example, the Prophet ﷺ tells us Surah Al-Baqarah, he tells us the name. He says, Ta'ti in, in a hadith, he says, Ta'ti Al-Baqarah wa Ali Imran. On the Day of Judgment, he says that Surah Al-Baqarah and Surah Ali Imran, so he gives us the names of both of these surahs, that they come on the Day of Judgment, and they come as uh, like clouds or birds, and they come to defend and to uh, intercede for the one who <clears throat> for the one who gave them their, yani, their rights, yani, meaning the one who, who learned them and read them and applied them and tried to live with them. Okay, so in this case, the Prophet ﷺ is naming the surah specifically. He gives us the names. And this is for many of the surahs in, in the Qur'an. That we have the names given to us by the Prophet ﷺ. 
some of the surahs of the Quran, there's a difference of opinion where the name came from. So some they said that it would it didn't come directly from the Prophet sallallahu but it came from like the companions after that. This is how they referred to to this surah, and in that case, that's where we see some of the differences or some of the surahs having these like multiple names or having uh, um, you know different. Uh, they're being referred to in different ways by different by different people. Okay, uh, and 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 what would happen is then over time that name would stick to that surah or the multiple names I should say would stick to that surah. And when we go back and we say again, what what's the goal of the names? The goal of the names is to give us uh, to identify the surahs, differentiate them from the other surahs. And so it's not as emphasized. Like the specific, like, oh, you have to uh, name it this name and that's it. Unless this was named and we know by the Prophet ﷺ and we have a clear evidence for that, right? Having said that, we know that also many of the scholars, they, they would take some of these names and they would find a connection to the theme or to the contents of the surah based off of the name of the surah based off of the name of the surah, right? And you would find also that a lot of the surahs, that they're named based off of something that is unique in that surah. And that goes back to this idea of uniquely identifying a surah, right? So for example, Surah An-Naml, that they call, it's called Surah An-Naml, the name of it is Surah An-Naml, because the only time that An-Naml is mentioned in the Quran, the ant, is in this surah. And so it becomes uniquely identified uh, through this through this fact, and that name sticks with it. Okay, and of course, like we said, if it's named by the Prophet sallallahu and we know that for sure, then that, then we can definitely make a connection as well between the surah or the name of the surah and possibly the contents of the surah. So, for example, Surah Al-Baqarah. Some of the scholars they say, what's the connection between the name of the surah? Yes, Baqarah. Uh, the, the, there's the story of uh, of the the baqara or uh, the cow, the steer, whatever you want to call it, right? In in this surah that's mentioned, but there's also the word baqar is is uh, mentioned also in surah al-an'am, okay? But the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam called surah al-baqara surah al-baqara, and so some of the scholars they made the connection between the name of the surah and the content. They said we found in surah al-baqara that there are a lot of laws and there's a lot of rulings. It's establishing like the personality of the Muslim ummah. It's giving them their unique characteristics and their unique kind of attributes as a, as a nation. Okay, so you have like the law of you know of of fasting and Hajj and you know there's some marriage and divorce and a lot of these things that are kind of molding this society and and building a community. Okay. And uh, and so they said that this connects with the name Surah Al-Baqarah. Why? Because the story of Al-Baqarah has to do with Bani Israel being given a command, i.e. Allah, by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They're given this, this directive to go and to slaughter a, a camel. And then the way that they responded to that command from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving us a lesson. Right, how they kept asking questions and, and they basically, you know, they, they didn't respond in the way that they should have initially responded. And so they made this connection that this surah is full of these laws, is full of these uh, directives that show us how to, how to live a life that is going to be successful and productive and beneficial. And so it makes sense that the surah is named Surah Al-Baqarah and there's that connection. How, do, how are we supposed to respond to these laws, respond to the ordinances, the commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? And again, this is kind of taking that next step, that deeper level of understanding and looking into uh, these connections, right? That, why is the surah named like this? And then what can we benefit from that, from the content of the surah? Why is this surah here? And then why is that surah in that place? Why is this surah you know, uh, named like this and why is it over there? So Surah Al-Sajda, 
right, is a surah that has these many names. And part of the names that are given to this surah come in, again, identifying this surah because of certain unique traits that it has. So for example, uh, one of the names of this surah is surah Alif Lam Mim Sajda. Alif Lam Mim As Sajda. Why? Because this is the only surah that combines between starting with Alif Lam Mim, right, this starting point, and having a verse of Sajda in it. And so it differentiates it from, for example, other surahs that start with Alif Lam Mim, right? Like Surah Al Baqarah starts with Alif Lam Mim, right? Uh, other surahs, many other surahs start with Alif Lam Mim, right? And but it's the only one that starts with Alif Lam Mim and that has a sajda. So that's why they would call it Alif Lam Mim as sajda. Or other surahs would have a sajda in it, right? But don't have, you know, uh, don't have the Alif Lam Mim. So for example, to differentiate surah to sajda from another surah, surah in the 25th or 26th juz, you have surah Hamim as sajda, 25th, I believe. And so that's why it's called that Hamim as sajda Because it starts with Hamim and it has a sajda So di to differentiate between these two surahs, this would be the name that was given to uh, to this surah. Some even call it surah Luqman as sajda Because it's the surah that comes after surah Luqman, which we took before, right? And it, it's the surah that has the sajda in it. So again, it goes back to this idea of, um, this idea of uh, uniquely identifying the surah, uniquely identifying the surah. There is Hamim Sajda too, exactly, right? So that's why that surah is called Hamim as Sajda because it starts with Hamim and it has a Sajda in it. Also from the names that are mentioned uh, in the surah that later on, Al-Munjiyah. Al-Munjiyah is the thing that saves. And this is based off of a narration that Imam Al-Qurtubi mentions in his tafsir in which he says that, uh, you know, and again, you take this, and this is not, we're not taking this as uh, uh, as law or as something yani, that we take like uh, like uh, revelation, because it's not revelation here. But he mentions uh, an incident of a person who uh, had a lot of mistakes, had a lot of sins, had a lot of, you know, shortcomings, but they had a deep love for this surah. And so they would continue to recite this surah. They would continue to recite this surah. And, and then after they passed away, they were seen in a dream and that they, you know, had some sort of special reward or benefit because of, uh, you know, this surah. And so this surah was like the thing that saved them, al-munjiyah, the savior, right? And again, that, that I'm not saying that that's okay, so now we have a lot of sins, I have a lot of sins, so we should just recite only sort of the sajda. But just, to, it's something that Imam al-Qurtubi mentioned in his tafsir that I thought is, uh, is interesting and, and why the surah uh, is sometimes called al munjiyah okay? And then al mabajir which means like the resting places because of the unique uh, word here that's only mentioned in, in this surah. And we're going to talk about that verse when Allah is describing these set of believers who, uh, you know, abandon their resting places, abandon their beds to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the deep parts of, of the night. Okay, and they sacrifice their sleep for uh, you know this meeting with the beloved with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? So that's some of the names, but you know, the most common name, like we've said, is either Alif Lam Mim as Sajda or what we're gonna just be calling it is the simplest, it's the one that's in the Musahif, generally Surah to Sajda. But I just wanted to go into that so that you have an understanding kind of of where these names are. Uh, come from and what's the benefit in them and also you know reflecting over them so you know as we go through this surah reflecting on what's the connection between the name sort of as sajda and then the contents of this surah what it delivers to us what we get from it what we benefit from it right <clears throat> uh, so this surah is a uh, a, a Meccan surah and actually, if you look, so, you know, if you have a, a mushaf uh, that has, you know, in like in the, in the index, it shows the surahs, right? And then some of the musahif, some of the copies of the, of the mushaf, they'll show you like uh, either a picture of the Kaaba or a picture of uh, the, the green dome of al-Masjid al-Nabawi. And that's telling you that either this surah is Mecca or 
or Madani, right? Some surahs don't cleanly fit like, oh, it's Makki, Madani, because they have like half, half. They have a lot of verses from here. But generally with the majority of the verses are, they'll, they'll classify as Makki or Madani. Some have differences of opinion. But you'll see, if you look at the surahs that we're covering, a lot of the surahs before what we took, and then a lot of the surahs after what we took are going to be Meccan surahs. They're going to be surahs that were revealed, Mecki surahs meaning revealed before the hijrah, revealed before the hijrah. And so you're gonna, we're going to have an emphasis on Mecki Qur'an, which is alhamdulillah a benefit. Obviously all of the Qur'an is beneficial, but it, I think is, is even, uh, there's a lot of benefit in it for the, for the, the goal of, of our class, which is to kind of try together to build a foundation, to build our connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to build our iman. And that was one of the primary focuses on uh, of the Meccan Quran is, is building strong, uh, like this firm connection with Allah, this firm iman. And whereas you'll find the Medina, uh, the Medina, Quran, the Madani surahs also focus on this, no doubt. But there's also an additional emphasis on law, on building a community, on building a society. We'll only take one surah that's a Madani surah. Does anyone know which surah? You can now here you can you can comment, you can write. Anyone know it's gonna be only one in all of this Ramadan? Because there's a lot of surahs that come after that are gonna be Meccan uh, Meccan uh, Quran and well, a lot of what we took before. There's one surah that's going to be Madani Quran, and it's a very, very, very beautiful surah as well. I'm looking forward to it a lot, inshallah. Let me see if anyone commented. No one commented. Does anyone know? You can go and, and, and search for it. People were like, I can't type it, but I know what it is. Al Ahzab, very good. Very good. Surat al Ahzab. So, Surat al Ahzab, which is the next surah after Surat al Sajda, if we get to it, inshallah. I always say that with the class because they know that sometimes we go on a lot of like, you know, we, we go this way instead of just going this way. Uh, but uh, Surat al Ahzab, the next surah after Surat al Sajda, is a, is a, uh, is a Madani surah. Surat al Ahzab, Zakum Lakhir to both of you. Um, that, that, that surah, inshallah, it's a very unique surah, actually. So uh, looking forward to that. But we're going to enjoy, this is also a very, very beautiful surah, uh, surah to sajda And actually, you know, subhanAllah, surah to sajda is, is unique. I, I, I didn't find a surah uh, that, you know, that has this amount of repetition from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Uh, which is interesting, right? We always say that if you find that there is something that is even more emphasized in the Quran, to pay attention to that thing. Yani the entire Quran, look, the Quran is 600 pages in our, in our Masahif, right? And if you have the one that has like 25, 30 lines on the page, I don't know how people read that one, then it's even less. It's like 300 pages, right? But it's, it's about 600 pages, give or take. And that's the entire Qur'an, right? So it, it, it's showing us that you don't have to have a lot to have something that's powerful, okay? Uh, the Qur'an is, is really, it's, it's mujiz. Yani it's, uh, it's, it's very uh, to the point, right? And summarized. But it's so powerful. And, and, and so every single word of the Qur'an carries... A message carries power, carries any importance. Now, if you find something that's being emphasized even more, so everything from the Quran is emphasized, but if you find something that's being emphasized even more, then that's a call for us to pay attention to it. So, for example, uh, the you know the, the directive that we have to recite Surah Al-Kahf every Friday. Okay. That's showing us that there's something in Surah Al-Kahf that we should pay attention to. There's something in there that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is turning our attention to, right? We know after every uh, salah, recite Ayatul Kursi, 
there's something in there. There's something beneficial. Every day, in the morning, in the evening, recite uh, surat, uh, the, the, the three quls. Qul wallahu ahad, qul adhu rabbi qul adhu nas. In fact, after every salah, recite it. And then in the morning, in the evening, three times. There's something there. There's something that we can take there. Surah al sajda is also one of those surahs. That it's authentically reported that the Prophet ﷺ on Friday mornings in Salatul Fajr, that he would recite in the first rak'ah Surah as sajda this surah here. It's three pages, okay? And I remember, and this is something that, you know, that uh, still a lot of places that they do, uh, right? Maybe not here as much, because if you, if you try to recite three pages in, in Fajr, you're going to get... Uh, <laughs> you're going to get a little bit of a hard time maybe after salah, right? Uh, but subhanAllah, you know, uh, I, sh I shouldn't even say that because the, our brothers and sisters, the ones who who, who make that, you know, uh, effort to go and pray Salatul Fajr in the masjid, and that was their, you know, their darb, any, their, their habit, you know, subhanAllah, they're, they're definitely not people who, who would complain, you know. I, I, so, you know, it's not... I take that back, actually, right? But uh, and and then, you know, Subhanallah, those who who that was their their habit and that was their practice, they're still being rewarded as if they go and they pray Salatul Fajr in the Masjid every morning. Something that we took for granted. Something that we said, oh, we just pray at home, or you know, you know, it's it's the Masjid is too far. I don't want to, you know, you know, we're missing out on that Subhanallah on that reward that they have now. So they're praying now at home here. And I know many of them, their hearts are, you know, uh, attached to the masjid and they wish that they could go pray any prayer, especially Fajr in the masjid, you know, but, but they're now praying here in their homes and subhanAllah, they're getting the reward. Well, people like us, you know, subhanAllah, we're, we're missing out on that because that wasn't a, a practice that we had. It wasn't a practice that we had, subhanAllah. So, um, it's it's uh, the, the, what I was saying though is uh, the that this surah this was from the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam to uh, recite uh, surah al sajda and again I, it is something that's still practiced uh, in in many of the masajid in many of the places that they would recite surah al sajda in the first rak'ah and they would recite uh, what was the sunnah as well. Which is surah? Does anyone know in the second rakah? You know, it takes some time to get like. So surah is the three pages. Then they would recite in the second rakah surah that's two pages. Surah al insan. Hal ata ala al insan yhinu min al dhar. Thought it was better to pray sixty plus ayat in the first rakah after how you combine with these two. So there, so there's a difference. Yeah, and a good question. Is that what so, so it's, for something to be better, it doesn't mean that that's always practiced. So there's no obligation in terms of the amount of ayats, right? But if the Prophet ﷺ is going opposite of his routine, and his routine would change depending on the circumstances. So there's something that he would do generally all the time. But even that doesn't make it an obligation unless we know for sure that it's an obligation with a specific evidence, right? But then there's other things that he would do depending on the circumstance, so for example, if there's a woman who has a baby and the baby is crying, that he would make the prayer shorter. That would go against what maybe his normal or his normative practice in Salah would be. But that's something that there is, uh, you know, that, that, that's, it, that's what his practice would be, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And so similarly here, it, normally maybe he would recite more in Salatul Fajr. But on Fridays, this would be his, this would be his sunnah. And that should show us also that there's something in here that we should take attention of, or we should take, you know, we should take heed uh, of and, and give attention to. And we should give attention to. So, uh, good question. Zakmullah So This was his sunnah. That he would recite in uh, the first rak'ah, surah to sajda. Not necessarily all the time. I didn't, I didn't come across anything that said that he would do this all the time. If someone knows if this was all the time of his practice, then they can help benefit us with that. But I know that this is what uh, was, you know, it's a thabit sunnah. It's a confirmed sunnah that he would recite it uh, 
uh, in the first rak'ah of Salat al-Fajr, and then Surah al-Insan, Hal ata'ala al-Insan hinum min al-Dahr, would be in the second rak'ah of Salat al-Fajr. Would be in the second rak'ah of, of, of Salat al-Fajr. So, um, so yes, so that is a one authentic narration, and it shows us, uh, yes, Surah Sajda and Surah Al-Insan and Fajr of Friday only. This is one we know. It doesn't mean he wouldn't recite these at any other salah, but it means that uh, we know, confirm that in Fajr on Friday that he would recite these surahs. And so the companions are narrating that this is something that, you know, that, that they noticed, this is something that was the, the, the practice of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to recite these two surahs in Salatul Fajr on on Friday, on Friday, okay? Also, there's another narration that mentions, although this narration has weakness to it, right? So it's not something I can say for sure, but it is something that's mentioned in the books of Tafsir as a hadith, but again, it has some weakness in it, that the Prophet ﷺ would also recite Surah Al-Sajda before he would go to sleep. Every night he would recite Surah Al-Sajda along with Surat al-Mulk. Surat al-Mulk is authentic. No doubt about that. That is thabit, right? That is verified authentic. This Surat Sajda, there is some uh, debate on its authenticity, right? Uh, but it is something that is, it is something that is mentioned, uh, okay? But, you know, what's interesting is that um, even let's say that it's not authentic, fine. Okay? But the fact that the Prophet ﷺ would emphasize reciting this surah every week or on specifically on Fridays in Salatul Fajr, which is, by the way, this is the best salah of the week. Salatul Fajr in Jama'ah at the masjid is the best prayer of the week after Jum'ah. After Jum'ah. From the regular prayers, this is the 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 most beloved of prayers to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay? And so this is actually something that we can uh you know uh, apply as a practical thing is on Fridays that we gather our families and we and we try to pray Salatul Fajr in in congregation with them, right? We're not able to pray in the masjid now, but we can take it as a practice and inshallah it can be something that that we can uh have as this practice. But this is the most beloved of prayers to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the Fajr of Friday. The Fajr of Friday. And in that salah, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa would choose to recite this surah. And surah al-insan. Okay? And this is something that I want you all to think about. Why this specific surah in this time, in this prayer? I want you to think about it. I was going to give the answer right away. But I want you to think about it, and tomorrow, inshallah, I will mention the answer. Tomorrow, inshallah, I will mention the answer once we go through a little bit of the introduction, before we start the actual verses of the surah, once we go through the introduction. But I want you, this is a good kind of uh, way of doing tadabbur, of reflecting. So maybe after class, read the surah. We're going to talk about now a little bit, inshallah, about the main goals of this surah, like what it covers, the 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 mawdu'ats, yani the, the themes and, and the contents of it in, in general, right? But why uh, this specific surah and why uh, this specific day? And that's the hints. That's the hints, okay? Why this specific surah and why this specific day? Uh, and it's something that the scholars, they, they do mention a, a wisdom and a lesson and a benefit. And, you know, it's it's not necessarily something that's, you know, that is uh, what we say is, you know, the, meaning the Prophet ﷺ didn't say, I'm reciting this surah on this day in this prayer for this reason. And so it's a little bit more flexible and open. You can reflect over it and maybe think of certain things that would show why this surah and then why this specific day. But there are some benefits and wisdoms, one specifically one that I'll mention, inshallah, uh, tomorrow, bi ta'ala. Why this specific surah? But I want I, I, Surah Al Sajda. Okay, uh, the second hint. Surah is it has something to do with both of the surahs. So you can go to both and try to look into both and see if there's a common link between both. 
And then that helps to develop the answer. Okay? And so that's the second hint. I'm only giving you two hints. I, I, I'm, I'm feeling more generous because it's Ramadan. Usually we let we have one hint. Right? But <laughs> we had, you know, uh, this question here that actually would make it hint number two. That it's uh, Surah Al-Sajda and, and Surah Al-Insan. I'm not going to respond to the, the, the answer that's, that was given here. I want you all to, to think about it, to reflect on it. And then we'll mention it tomorrow, inshallah. We'll mention it tomorrow. There was also a question I, I, I saw about the four. Is it the four quls? So the four quls, which includes Surah Al-Kafirun, that also has benefit in being recited at, at specific times. But um, the three quls, are the ones that are usually mentioned together. So reciting it after every salah, it's the three quls that are usually mentioned. I think some mention the fourth as well, but I'm not sure. It's something I have to go back and check. And then uh, before going to sleep, the three quls are those are specifically mentioned as well. That's for sure. Uh, because of the protection that they provide. Because of the protection that, that, they, that they provide. Okay. Um, so yes. So, but the the thing that we take from this is that this surah definitely has something special about it, or it definitely gives us something that is emphasized in the fact that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam gives it that extra emphasis, gives it that extra emphasis. And this is a, a, again a general rule and a general principle that we can apply that we give importance to that which Allah and His Messenger give importance to, and that we give priority to that which Allah and His Messenger give priority to, in the Qur'an and outside the Qur'an as well. If Allah is emphasizing something, mentioning something first, then that's an indication that we should do that as well. And this is what the Prophet ﷺ would do as well. And I think I mentioned it in this class uh, before as well. You know, uh, when the Prophet ﷺ would be going in, in his Hajj and his Umrah, and he would be walking to uh, Safa and Marwa, and he would recite the ayah in Safa wal Marwa min Allah. He would say, "Nabda'u bima bada Allahu bihi." We start with what Allah Subhanahu wa Taala starts with. We begin with what Allah Subhanahu wa Taala begins with. So Allah begins with um, Safa. He says, "Inna Safa." He mentions Safa before Marwa. So that's where we begin, and that's where we start. This idea of emphasizing, prioritizing, beginning where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala begins. And this is, again, you know, on a deeper level, this, is, uh, this shows a level of, you know, uh, of love. And, 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 you know, to give priority to that which your, uh, you know, the one that you love gives priority to, you know. And we see this with, with those that we love and those that we you know, we have that connection with that if they love something, then, then, then we try to, to engage in that thing as well. Or we try to give that person that thing that they love because even if we don't love it, because it's something that we know that they love, right? And you know, subhanAllah, this is how the companions were with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And it's, very, it's a very beautiful thing to see. You know, like Anas ibn Malik radiallahu anhi would say uh, that, uh, I saw that the Prophet ﷺ loved dubba, squash. And I would see that, you know, when there would be a plate of food, كان يتتبع الدبا, that he would, uh, he would go and specifically, uh, like, look for those pieces of, of, like that, of that squash. And then Anas ﷺ would say, and out of, you know, uh, because of the love of the Prophet ﷺ for that thing, I love that thing as well, right? So it became something that that he loved because uh, he saw that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam loved it, right? That's that's like a a deeper level of love. No one's saying that you have to eat squash or even that it's sunnah to eat squash in the in the in like the technical definition of the word that you know you get uh, like this is from the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Right, like in, in, a, in, a, in a worship form, but you know, just it's out of love for the Prophet that he's like that. I love that food too. That I would see that the Prophet loved that, right? 
and 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 vice versa as well. So you would find, you know, in, in the story uh, when you would have Abu Ayyub al Ansari when when he was staying with the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam in his home, right? When he first, when the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam first comes to Medina, and he would, uh, you know, they would make food and they would give it to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam to eat first from, and then and then when it would be sent back to them, they would eat from that where they saw the Prophet Sallallahu ate from, right? And so just to get the barakah yani, from him, like if he, they saw he ate from here, I want to eat from here, right? And uh, one time he gives the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi like a dish that had garlic and onion in it, or maybe just garlic. And so uh, the Prophet Sallallahu he, Alaihi he, he takes it, or it's given to him, but then he sends it back. Or he gives it to, to Abu Ayyub. And they see that he didn't eat from it. And so Abu Ayyub, he gets scared. He's like, why didn't the Prophet Sallallahu eat from what we gave him? Something wrong, something happened. And so he asks the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Ya Rasulullah, why didn't you eat from this? And, and Abu Ayyub, uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he says, you know, it has, uh, he's like, I, you know, it's obviously not insulting or not anything wrong with, you know, you giving. But it has garlic or it has onion in it. And, you know, Jibreel comes to me and people come and visit. Uh, Jibreel comes with revelation and people come and visit. And so I didn't want, you know, uh, my breath to, 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 to be affected and for it to be, to be a bother to the people or to Jibreel. Right? So, and so that's why he's sending it back. And this shows also another tangent. And you'll see we're going, we're going on a lot of these tangents. We haven't even started this surah yet. But uh, that... This shows again the, the importance of, of taking care of ourselves as well and being clean. And, and you know, it, it's not in, in, you know, you don't want to make your breath stink on purpose because of, you know, uh, you know I'm, I'm fasting, right? Uh, that, that hadith that mentions that Allah, the, the, that, that smell that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves, that we combine that with the fact that the Prophet sallallahu when he would fast, he would use the miswak. Right? And we know that that's, that smell, it doesn't necessarily come from the mouth, but it comes from what's called like the ma'idah, like the inside. And so we, it's still there, of course, and, and it's still a, a beautiful thing. But, you know, to, to, to brush one's teeth and, and to use the siwak and these things is also something that the Prophet ﷺ would do in fasting. And then beyond fasting as well, you know, he would, uh, you know, emphasize so much his own cleanliness, Right? And, and before he would enter his home, he would use siwak. And when he would leave his home, he would use siwak. And before he would make wudu, he would use siwak. And when be, you know, uh, before he would pray, he would use the siwak. And he loved good smells and smelling good and, and, and these kind of things as well. In fact, he would say, from the things that I love from this dunya, that was made beloved to me in this dunya, he said, a plebe, right? Some, a good smell, right? Like the itr and, and, and these things that make a person you know, smell good. And he, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as a man, of course, and he, that's, it's limited to that, but he would go out, you know, with, with a, a good smell. And he naturally had a good smell too. So it emphasizes that as well. And that's something that's important for us to emphasize. But what I was mentioning was that, uh, so, so that, that's why he sent it back. And so he even mentioned, he's like, I dislike it. فَإِنِّي أَكْرَهُهُ Like, I, I dislike it because of these things. And when Abu Ayyub radiallahu an is very beautiful, when he heard the Prophet sallallahu say this, he said, Inni idan akrahuhu aydan, ya Rasulullah. He says, if you dislike it for that reason, ya Rasulullah, I dislike it for that reason as well. Right? So this idea of prioritizing uh, the, the love of, uh, of, of the one that the person, of, of the beloved. And so this is the simil uh, a similar idea here. That we, that we find that if this is something that's being given emphasis by Allah and by His Messenger, then it's important for us. It's something that we take uh, as benefit to, uh, to give emphasis as well, as well, inshallah. Okay. So I know um, usually our class... In the uh, like throughout the year, it goes to 115. I think we kind of uh, advertise this as going from 11:30 to one 
as well uh, or, or, or separately. So I think we'll, we'll, we'll uh, keep it in this range between 1 and 115, inshallah, uh, because it's the first day and, you know, it's a lot. And I want you guys to come back, inshallah. <laughs> so uh, we'll end here. Uh, and tomorrow, inshallah, we'll talk about what we talked about. We'll talk about some of the virtues or the concept of virtues of surahs in the Quran. We'll talk about what this surah, uh, its its kind of primary uh, goals and focuses and, and, and like thematically look into the surah. And then inshallah, we will jump into the verses of the surah. So again, if you're kind of coming new to this, uh, you'll see we kind of take our time. <laughs> Sometimes we go quick through certain things. Sometimes we, we take our time. I do go on a lot of uh, these tangents as well. And, um, you know, you can complain in the comments. Doesn't necessarily mean that I'm going to stop, but we'll allow, <laughs> inshallah, to, uh, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll make it something that, you know, we'll, we'll take in people's considerations as well. Um, but it's, it's something that, you know, it's, it's to, we'll try to enjoy, enjoy this, this journey. The goal is not, I have a, a certain idea of how much I want to get through, inshallah, by the end of, Ramadan. I won't mention that to you because I don't want you to kind of constantly be like, that's usually what happens. There's like, we're going to finish this much. So it's like, at least for me, it's like, okay, well, we got through this much. So we still need this much. We still need that much. Just kind of try to enjoy uh, the journey uh, along the way and incorporate maybe some of the things that we're, we're doing, we're learning into your own uh, relationship with, with the Quran. Um, this is a good place to start, but not, you know, don't let this be the end all be all and everyone is on their own pace as well so the idea is that we're improving we're, we're gradually getting better together and then as individuals as well inshallah so inshallah we will uh so there's a, if there's any questions we can take those before we end inshallah can you recommend a good quran tafsir in english okay so the the tafsir have different like there's different types of tafsir that provide that that like give different uh they have different goals in mind, you could say. Right? So some of the tafasir are there to just give you like, just to know the meaning and to give you like any uh, relevant like hadith or any relevant statement of the companions. It's called tafsir bin riwaya, like tafsir by, uh, by like the text and by, by the, the narrations, okay? And that's like a very straightforward and it's a good place to start. So... That's different than more of like what's called tafsir bidiraya, which is more of like reflective tafsir. Um, and, and that comes with, of course, knowing the meaning and then like expanding upon that. And that's where you see like the different mufassirin kind of, you know, they, get, they, they have their own flavor and, and it's like that mix of their own experience and their own knowledge and these things kind of coming out to bring out a tafsir. So the tafsir in English that I would recommend as a good starting point there's a couple. Uh, there's one called Aysar At-Tafasir. Aysar At-Tafasir, the easiest of Tafasir. I, now, you're going to be upset when you, when you hear me say this. I don't know if it's translated in English, but it's a good starting point Tafsir, and I think it is translated in English. It's by Sheikh Abu Bakr al-Jazairi, uh, rahimahullah, uh, the, uh, the, the teacher in, the former teacher in, in, in the Masjid al-Nabawi, uh, he had he put t this tafsir that's a very very basic breakdown of of the tafsir. And it's a good starting point. If it's not translated in English, then I would recommend uh, another tafsir that was written by a scholar who passed away again not that long ago in the last fifty to hundred years. His name is Sheikh Abdul Rahman uh, Al Saidi, and and he has a tafsir. Um, that is in English. It is in English. The name escapes me. Right? Uh, uh, he said, "Taysir uh, Kalam al Rahman." Taysir. It's it's basically it's called Taysir Kalam al Rahman fi Tafsir Kalam al Manan, something like this, right? But in English, you can just look it up as Tafsir al Saidi. Uh, tafsir al Saidi. Uh, Saidi S I and then like apostrophe. I-D-I, -I, something like that. 
that's in English as well. I don't know if it's like on PDF English or you'd, or you'd have to buy it. And then the most classical, straightforward, uh, like it is one of the greatest works of tafsir. And it, but it's, it's, it's very straightforward as well. Uh, and in terms of delivering like the meanings is uh, tafsir ibn Kathir, which definitely has been translated in English. There's an abridged version in English that's 10 volumes. That I'm pretty sure is, oh, it's, that is, I'm not, not pretty sure, I'm sure, I've seen it definitely. It's online, it's in our masajid, uh, you'll find it in almost all of the masajid as well. But uh, for our intents and purposes, obviously you can find it online. And I know there's a lot of others that have been translated, um, you know, like in tafsir.com, I think that's a, that's a website that has a lot of these tafsir that you can like compare compare these tafsir to. There's also uh, there's also there's also others there's also others but those that I mentioned are a good just starting point because some of the other ones are a little bit deeper so you have obviously tafsir you have tafsir al qurtubi and tafsir al tabari and tafsir al jalalain and, and and these other tafsir but there's a little bit more uh, depth to those and they're a little bit more advanced so if we're at a starting point those are the ones that I would mention aysal al tafsir the easiest of tafsir uh, tafsir al Sa'di, which is also called Taysir, uh, Kalam al Rahman, Kalam al Mannan, I think. And then uh, Tafsir ibn Kathir, the abridged version. Uh, inshallah. So those are, are, are the three that I would recommend. Any other, uh, any other questions before we, before we close out? Okay, I think then we'll, we'll end there. Uh, again, remember tomorrow, inshallah, 11.30, same place, same time. Maybe we'll have a different background. <laughs> we'll see, inshallah, uh, what we have. And uh, we'll see you all tomorrow. Jazakumullah khair. Subhanakallahumma bihamdik. Nashhadu an la ilaha illa ant. Nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.